you have to actually understand the area before you can put together a good set of requirements. And so I think that's where maybe that RFI really can help because you don't know what's out there. You don't know what are the standard set of requirements. Obviously, if you start putting together requirements, like the system must be able to levitate above the ground, like no system's going to meet that. So you have to have... But it's in the cloud. Yeah, it levitates automatically. It. <laughs> yes. This is Identity at the Center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, not so bad yourself? Man, it's been quite a week. Um, and it's only Monday already. So <laughs> it's been quite a day. It's, I'm on mountain time. So part of my challenge right off the bat is that 6 a.m. is 8 a.m. Mm-hmm. Um, by the time that I get everything together, it's like 7 a.m. And the world is like full speed and I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a pro tip for consulting. Don't live in the West Coast <laughs> because everything's going to be done in Eastern time. <laughs> or just embrace the why. early life and the early release, I guess, right? People kind of disappear probably around 3 p.m., you know, for for folks on the West Coast. But yeah, that's that's life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I don't think I could do it. You know, I, I thought about, you know, moving to Hawaii or something and, it would be great, but you'd have to get up so dark early, man, like two in the morning, three in the morning. That's not going to work for me. Well, if you're moving to Hawaii, you, you probably can just set your own schedule at that point. <laughs> yeah, right. You've saved up your pennies. Exactly. Uh, so you have a little bit of a different background. You're, you must be traveling, right? You said you're I'm traveling. I'm, I'm in Sturgis, South Dakota. And so my partner, Denise, grew up here. This is actually her family home. Um and, you know, this house he built in the 60s, late 60s. And, um, yeah, I mean, so it's, you know, eight foot ceilings and everything. And but it's a it's a great home. I feel really comfortable here. And then, of course, what's going on in Surge of South Dakota is they have the big motorcycle rally every year. And it's pretty crazy, man. I have a motorcycle I ride, but there are motorcycle enthusiasts here who you know come from all parts of the world um most of the people come in from the united states and ride their bikes and it's pretty crazy man there's like hundreds of thousands of motorcycles here sounds very loud <laughs> it's super loud it's super loud on top of all the rock and roll music that your heart could desire and there's, there's a big concert, right, too, that kind of goes along with this? A bunch of There's artists. a lot of big concerts. Yeah, last night we saw someone named Elle King. Um, oh, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, country. I know Elle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's like a country star. She's really good. Um, Jelly Roll's going to be here this week. Travis Tritt was here last night. Um, is anybody good uh, going to be Kid, there? <laughs> Kid Rock was, is going to be here. I like Kid Rock. I like Jelly Roll. I like Travis Tritt. Um so it sounds very country. country, but well, there's a lot of, um, you know, cover bands. Uh, Brent Michaels is going to be here. So it's a lot of like, it's music that would appeal to like motorcycle folks. And okay. a lot of the people I think who, who ride motorcycles, uh, well, there's, there's really a big age range, but there are definitely a lot of people with, you know, gray hair. <laughs> it sounds, it sounds like a very interesting uh, event. Are there any electric bikes? That's what would interest me. Any e-bikes? Like electric I motorcycles? I haven't seen a single one. I haven't seen a single one. See, and, that interests you know, the me. Bikes, the bikes I like a, a lot are the custom bikes where people go and like, you know. They can put the handles out like, money. like this. Like, I don't get that. Like that doesn't seem very comfortable. <laughs> or safe. Right. Yeah, I don't know, man. That's I don't, why I don't have enough a... time riding my regular motorcycle. I don't think I can ride something like that. <laughs> I'm not a gearhead, so uh, I, I'm more interested in the technology side. So that's why I asked about the the electric, you know, bike, meaning like the electric motorcycle. That seems like that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, I did see a, a Tesla charger somewhere, and I, of course, that'd be immediately. 
Mm. Like Jeff be hanging out there. <laughs> well, you have, you have to have a place to charge. You know what you're going to do. Um, all right. So you're in Sturgis. You're on the road. I'm on the road like every day for this month, I feel like, <laughs> except for maybe a couple. So it's made scheduling this podcast extremely challenging. So uh, hats off to you for pulling this together. Um, we're going to try and make this show a little bit shorter, just in the interest of time and making sure that we put something out that's quality. Uh, but I do want to give a shout out. A gentleman by the name of Ron sent in an email or Ronald sent in a, a contact form to us and noticed there was a bug at our website. I've been chasing this bug for a long time. And if I was like, oh, I th- thought I had it fixed. Well, now I think I have it fixed again. So if you have been using our listen page on our website, and then you would refresh, what would happen is you'd go to a 404 page because for some reason it kept looping around to a page that no longer existed as I was doing some work on the site. I think I have fixed it <laughs> again. So we'll see how it works. But shout out to Ron for noticing the bug and actually taking the time to send in a, a uh, you know a message to let us know about it. And yeah. uh, I will cross my fingers. Hopefully it is now fixed again. My shout out to Ron is like, I just heard that bug like six months ago, Jeff. And I told you about it, and I, I think thought I had it fixed. Solution. It was my fault. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's it's usually is it's it's usually a user right ID ten T uh, problem yeah. or pebcac right something like that. So okay, well shout out to him. Uh, let's see what else we got. Identity week coming up. You and I are going to be there. We're starting to figure out what that plan is going to look like. Uh, I'll be yes. hosting sort of a hour long panel talk, question and answer type thing for the future of identity and access management. So you'll see that that session is now up on the identity week America agenda. So hopefully people will come out and check that out. Uh, if you do, we have discount code. So if you use the code IDAC three zero, that gets you 30% off of your identity week registration. And that's good for both the America conference, which is uh, September 11th and 12th in Washington, DC and the Asia conference, which is in Singapore, October 22nd, 23rd. So IDAC three zero type that in, you get 30% off. And shows support, for, uh, shows support for the show. Easy for me to say. And I uh, appreciate that. Same thing for the Authenticate Conference. That's coming up also October. It's going to be a very busy <laughs> couple months for you, for you and I, Jim. October 14th through 16th in Carlsbad, California. Love it. Great spot. Uh, IDAC15. You get 15% off of your Authenticate uh, registration. So we will be there. Uh, we originally were going to record a session with Andrew Shikiar. He had some travel uh, things pop up over the weekend. Uh, so if you saw his notes on LinkedIn, I was like, oh, that might be a problem for us. But we're going to have him back on here in the next couple of weeks and uh, get something out to kind of talk about the the next Authenticate conference in a little more detail with him. So with that business out of the way, I think the other thing we want to take today was we got a really good question from a listener. And we're basically going to take this entire talk the rest of the time we have to talk about that one question and maybe get into a little bit more detail but try to keep it uh, sort of on rails for us. <laughs> yeah. So that's where we're at. Anything else you want to get before we get to our question? No, I was just thinking of something that with all the, the travel nightmares going on, just, you know, fourth wall, third wall or third wall or fourth wall. Anyway, fourth wall, a I guess. hurricane <laughs> moving through the Southeast as we speak right now. Mm-hmm. It's getting very close to Augusta, Georgia, which is my other home, home away from, no, no, that's my name. That's where I live now. So yeah, we're right on the edge. I, like I looked at the path today and it's like, you're just outside of it. And I'm just outside of a natural. We're kind of like two hours apart from that same side. Yeah. So depending on the trajectory, we could either totally miss it, totally get hit or somewhere in between. <laughs> yeah. And I've been lucky for the past few years where I haven't gotten hit by one, but um, yeah, the, the fork, I haven't been watching it all day. It's been one of these days. Um, but I, yeah, I think at one point it was like, we're in the dead on center path. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll see. I mean, I'm flying out to New York tomorrow night. And so this is, let's see, what's, what's today? Today is Monday, the fifth. And so I'm flying out Tuesday, the sixth to, uh, where am I going? Minneapolis. Um, and so as long as my flight leaves on time, I don't care at that point. (laughs) Then you're happy. And then I'm happy to get there first thing. Yep, got that for a couple of days and then headed to Dallas uh, for this weekend uh, for some fun personal time uh, with friends. And then, uh, yeah, back to reality uh, Monday or Tuesday next week. So kind of a, all over the place this week. But let's get to our question. How about that? Yeah. Okay. Um, this came from Alfred. 
uh, from Canada. It doesn't specify where, just Canada. So Canada at large. <laughs> I'm about to issue an RFP for an IAM system. What are some tips or tricks to make sure it goes smoothly? I love and hate this question. <laughs> Uh, let me start first. I'll say I like it because I think this is an opportunity to maybe help people out there figure out how to do a good RFP, especially from the customer side. And I've been on the customer side, so I kind of know how that works. Now I'm on typically the respondent side, right? The vendor side, whether it's implementation or advisory services or whatever it may be. And so on that side, I am really not a fan of RFPs because I feel like they are a lot of work for very minimal value. Because here's the secret. Every RFP answer you're going to get is going to say yes in some way, shape, or form. Of course it can do that. <laughs> um, and so I feel like it's, um, I think it's a little bit of an art to make sure that, one, you've got appropriately phased questions, but that you don't get lost in, I don't know, administrata when it comes to an RFP. So that's my initial thoughts when I hear RFP for IAM system. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. My, I think those are great points. I think my initial thought is, you know, what seat do you have in the organization? I think if you're the person who's like the IAM practitioner of your organization, you have to ask the question, how objective or subjective do I want this to be? Do you want it to be a very much an objective exercise where it's like we rate certain points on certain requirements and things like that? It doesn't give you a whole lot of leeway to, you know, direct your decision toward a vendor that you're really impressed by, or maybe you've gone to the conferences and you really think that one system or one integrator is going to give you a better end product than another, or I'm not going to get change order to death and things like that. So I, I think that's a, a big key. Uh, actually put the change order piece aside because it's, it's, it's a totally separate exercise, but you know, me personally, I like to, allow for more subjectivity when it comes to an RFP. I think this price aspect is a very big one because I've seen some RFPs where it's like submit the price and there's not much specificity in terms of how much the price influences the decision or it's set to a, a smaller percentage. I've seen it where it's been a very high percentage of how an RFP response gets graded. And when it's a very high percentage, Everyone's motivated to give you a better price. Sounds great, right? But I think most um, respondents, whether they're consultants or um, software firms, you know, they're not going to like give away their services or give away their software, right? They're they're going to try to whittle down enough to to extend a a very good price. So I think that. There's a danger in putting too much weight in the price, especially early on. So I think you have to ask yourself, too, is what is what is it you're looking to get out of this RFP? Because, you know, tips or tricks to make this run smoothly. Like, why are you doing it? Do you are you doing it because you have to do it? <laughs> right. Is it some sort of like internal organizational governance step that because this is expected to be X number of dollars, you must submit to RFP and have X number of minimum, you know, responses, right? That sort of thing. Um, you know, government definitely does it like this pretty much all the time. But I think you need to understand, like, what is the end goal? Like, what are you hoping to get out of this RFP? Is it find a solution? Is it determine pricing? Is it you don't know what you're looking for and you're hoping that somebody out there has a solution that kind of meets the needs that you've put onto a piece of paper. <laughs> so I think the first thing is make sure you know what you want to get out of the RFP, because then you can start to figure out what are the questions you want to ask? What's the questions you don't want to ask? You don't care about, right? Don't waste time for things that aren't relevant to your output or at least your, your intended outcome anyway. Yeah. You know, I, I also think that if you're very early in the process and you have the time to do it, you can start with an RFI request for information and then come to some kind of come forward and start to understand your requirements a little bit better, tell you about their software and or services, and you can start to get a feel for the landscape. Now, I think if you're a company that um, does not have to go through a formal RFP process, an RFI might be preferable, where you go out and you use it as a tool to gather information. The RFP then gives you kind of a structured process for 
selecting a final, um, a final bidder, if you will. Um, and that's the part where I usually see the hang up where it's like, you know, if you're, um, not setting up your RFP in a, in a strategic way and, uh, getting pricing set in, in such a, or using pricing in such a way that it doesn't become um, something where it's like, okay, we're going to kind of narrowly meet your requirements, but very narrowly just so we can get the lowest price so that we make the finalist list. Mm -hmm. You bring a good point there. Like not everything has to be an RFP. Maybe you are more interested in an RFI because you do want that information or an RFQ request for quote. You just want pricing information based on certain information. Um, You know, I think there are options here, but I think the first question to ask yourself is what do you want to get out of this and make sure you tailor the RF X, you know, I Q P (laughs) whatever the letters are uh, to make sure that you're using the appropriate vehicle to get that information. So, okay. So now we've kind of figured out, okay, what are we trying to get out of it? What are, you know, for an IAM system, there's probably some technical requirements, but it's probably more focused on business requirements is what I'm thinking or functional requirements. Meaning I'm looking for a system that can do this, right? I want to onboard an identity from, I don't know, work day into my, Active Directory or into my SAP or, you know, name whatever applications. Um, is that, does that ring a bell or does that resonate with you all? Because I feel like most RFPs are really kind of focused on sort of the requirements aspect of things. Right. There definitely, it definitely seems like um, requirements are the driver and kind of the waiting for most RFPs. I think a good process for gathering document those requirements is you know, the, the activity of going through developing a strategy. So if you have a strategy and say for IAM, we're talking about a single sign on system. It could be a customer sign on system. It could be, um, employee. It could be your IGA system or privilege access management, or maybe you're getting into identity proofing, but it's some area you have to actually understand the area before you can put together a good set of requirements. And so. I think that's where maybe that RFI really can help because you don't know what's out there. You don't know what are the standard set of requirements. Obviously, if you start putting together requirements, like the system must be able to levitate above the ground, like no system's going to meet that. So you have to have... But it's in the cloud and it levitates automatically. (laughs) Yes. Potentially, you could get lucky. Um, I think what you want to do, though, is like understand how what's out there in the market now um, now I'm not saying you should build your requirements to steer your RFP one way or the other. Um, but you have to actually know, like, say you're interested in ITDR, like what are the use cases that are solved by ITDR? And I think when you go and you research ITDR, you're going to find that the set of use cases that different vendors provide can be quite different. I think when you look at, um, access management for, uh, customer identity and access management, you're going to find that most use cases are very similar. Similar, but different (laughs) because there's always some weird wrinkle that's like, okay, well, we want a customer identity and access management platform that does everything a CIM platform does. And we also want to do this other really weird custom thing. It could definitely be the custom thing, or it could even be just like, what the approach is. You know, I remember with customer identity and access management, Okta used to go up against Alt Zero. Now they're in the same company, but Okta's focus was a, a tool focus for, um, I think, like the engineering community. You could get into the system and configure it using the UI. Um, Alt Zero was very much focused on the developer community. So it would give you a lot of code samples and ways to integrate it with the using APIs. And so you see those two systems basically functionality uh, was very similar, but the approach to integrating and operating those tools is very different. And you may have a comfort level with one over the other. Yeah, that's true. I think that's, again, probably one of the good requirements is, you know, do you need things like APIs and other sort of dev-friendly tools, or are you looking for something that is configurable right out of the box, theoretically, um, and try yeah, to stay and within that? You know, sometimes um, with RFPs, you find that 
it's just like a grab bag of every requirement out there. And I think that's a, a very immature way to approach it because, you know, having every feature, like if you went and you bought your Tesla and you got every feature under the sun, every feature that was available to it, but you didn't even know that you had those features or how to access them and you didn't have any reason to use them. What good would they do? You just be spending money for something that you didn't need. Mm-hmm. And I think that, um, sometimes from a practitioner's perspective, I don't know all of what I need. So I'm going to ask for everything. Um, I think that that ought to trigger the, the thought that, well, maybe I need to put more thought or research into this rather than just keep things in. I know we're all dealing with deadlines and things like that, but. You re- I guess the, the end summary from my perspective is that you really need to know what you're asking for. Yeah, that's a really good point because if you don't know what you're asking for, you're going to get blinded or distracted by something shiny or something that is really not, you know, something that you even care about from a, from a capability standpoint. I think like, I, I've been on this soapbox about AI for the last couple of years and I'm, I'm on record, right? I love AI. I think it's awesome. But there's a lot of companies that get distracted like, oh, we can do AI this and that they're still like haven't gotten the basics down. You really can't do some things until you do the basics well. And this is an area where you want to be very careful. That you don't get distracted, especially for an area or a subject matter that you're not really an expert. in. If you haven't taken the time to build up expertise, I would say go find someone who is to help you with that. Because I said at the very beginning, every vendor is going to say, yes, we can do that. And then twist the answer so it makes sound, makes it sound like their yes <laughs> meets meets your need, and so you want to really be able to understand the nuances between okay, does that make sense or did they you know did it twist it around into a convoluted answer right or or something on those lines? So I would definitely recommend at least know something about your subject. If you don't know about it, go find someone who does, right? Whether it's right. someone internal or read a book or watch a video or hire a consultant, right? That knows that kind of area. Um, I think that would pay off in the long run. Yeah, you know, I, as we've been having this conversation, I've also thought about the positive aspect of an RFP. So I generally don't like RFPs. I, I, I kind of tend towards what you said earlier, but I just put on the cap of trying to be positive. Um, you know, one thing that we've seen over time is that people want to take the top leaders in the magic quadrant. I'm picking on the magic quadrant because so many people rely on it. But they say that that the space is just the the leaders. I think by putting an RFP out, you may get a response that surprises you from a vendor that maybe you're not familiar with, or maybe a service provider that you haven't done business with in the past comes along and just like, wow, they actually have their stuff together and they have a solution that's a better fit and they understand my industry better than maybe the incumbents or the leaders in the space. And I think one thing that I'm not saying it's the case now, but I think it's traditionally happened over time in this space is that sometimes the, the leaders, they get, I don't know if lazy is the right word. That sounds very negative, <laughs> but they get so big that they don't innovate as fast. And you have these up and comers that are innovating like crazy. And I mean, you've seen it with some of our sponsor spotlight episodes where some of these up and coming vendors are coming out with features that nobody else has. And I'm thinking of, you know, the little security with that feature around, you know, you can kind of like point and click on a cloud application to kind of train its AI on how to run an access certification. It's like, that's innovative, man. I haven't seen that anywhere else. So I think, you know, looking down market sometimes can be a, a, you can be forced to do that by RFPs. But I also think if you make your RFPs so difficult to respond to, it's going to turn those, those vendors off from even trying. Yeah. I, please, if you're, if you're putting an RFP out there, make it reasonable. <laughs> and there's people who spend a lot of time on these. I feel like I do one to two of these per month, it seems like. And a lot of them ask, ask similar or same questions. So that's, you know, kind of whatever. Uh, but that idea that you mentioned about down market, I think is a really interesting one because there are a lot of good products that are not yet Gartner magic quadrant, right? They just started out. Of course, they're not up in the upper right yet because they don't have any market share. They don't have customers, you know, et cetera. 
So there are some really good products there. They're also hungry for customers. So you may get better pricing or better terms on a contract or maybe even influence the direction of the product to, you know, to some degree. So it's definitely worth you know, really kind of shaking the bushes a little bit and seeing what's out there before you just say, okay, well, we know it's going to be you know, this solution or this is the type of IAM system we're looking for and we know about the big two or big three in the industry. We'll just send it to them. And, you know, you end up with just those and that's how it kind of self feeds itself, right? They keep getting bigger and bigger and it becomes harder for the smaller, more innovative companies to do it on their own. And then eventually they get bought out by somebody <laughs> and become part of the board of the bigger company. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, another thing I would recommend doing in like some like biggest thing, the obvious is combining software and services into a single RFP. And the reason I think to do that is it's a time saver. I don't think you'd want to go out and select technology and then say, oh, how are we going to implement this now? Um, and have to go either go to another RFP or, I mean, if you're, if you have to do RFPs, I guess that's what you would do. Um, or if your plan is to just go with the software vendors resources, I don't generally find that that's the optimal way to go about implementing you know, co uh, commercial itself, but we're uh, software as a service products. Yeah, there's very few software vendors that really want to stick around for a, you know, long term implementation. They might help you out with like, you know, a first phase or kind of getting up and running, but that's not their business model. They don't really want to be in that mode of, okay, we know we're deploying an IAM system. It's going to be a three-year program and we're expecting to introduce a bunch of different capabilities. Generally speaking, you know, the software vendors are not in that. That's where partners come in, implementation partners, et cetera. And that's where you definitely want to make sure that um, you know, you've got the right implementation partner. Because I feel like that's one of the most important decisions you can make is you can have the best product in the world, but if you have a terrible integration partner, you're going to have a bad experience with that. <laughs> that's, then that's it. You can also have a product that is considered maybe not as capable and if you have a really good partner that really understands the tool and is you know innovative in the way they use it, you can have a great experience, better than if you had bought the quote leader right in the space. So there's a lot of calculus that kind of comes into this. Absolutely, yeah. And I, you know, I think this whole model of like one throat to choke, um, I think that there's just as many tears that get associated with that idea as there are with um, oh, we have so many vendors and things like that. I, I think you made a point earlier about smaller vendors sometimes going in exceeding expectations to, uh, and it's not just smaller vendors, but it's sometimes it's vendors who, you know, get an opportunity to um, associate their name with, with yours. It doesn't have to be a small company, but just somebody who's like hungry for your business rather mm -hmm. than just handing the business over to the biggest get biggest name on the block. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's, uh, there's, there's options out there, I guess is probably the best way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other yeah. thing that I find interesting sometimes in these conversations is, and this tends to come out more in the implementation side is what is your experience, you know, deploying this product or performing this service, whatever. And I find a lot of companies struggle, at least on the, on the, on the, on the responder side around like, okay, well, you know, collectively, like, you know, Jim, you and I have 40 years, 40, 50, 50 years almost of experience doing IAM work. That experience doesn't go away when you and I change companies, right? We've been through identropy, Protivity, and now we're with RSM. And each of those companies gained the benefit of our collective years of experience. So even if you have a company that maybe is a newer, maybe identity firm or whatever it may be, don't discount the personal histories of the people who will be involved with the project. And the people involved with the project should absolutely be part of the response. You want to know who's there, you know, are they going to be assigned? And you never know, a lot of companies will not name resources because it's very difficult from the company's perspective to say, well, we don't know if Jeff and Jim are going to be here next year. They might win the lottery or the podcast takes off and they get a Netflix special, <laughs> right? Or something like that. <laughs> um, here's, here's hoping, right? Not going to win. Um, but you definitely want to have a sense of what are the people that are going to be involved with your project? Are they experienced? 
don't discount personal experience is just what I'm saying as part of that, that equation that applies to vendors as well, because you could have a lot of really smart people who maybe they did a startup and they're just getting out the gates, but they spent, you know, 50 years building Watson at IBM and they know AI inside and out, <laughs> right? That experience didn't just go away because they changed companies. Right. And I think that if you're not in an RFP scenario, you can easily judge that for yourself. If you, if you are putting on an RFP, don't, don't make it so objective and so tightly worded that you miss out on those kind of things. I think that's the real key is like, don't make your RFP so difficult to respond to that you don't really get the right information. Um, well, not I think even just respond thing- to Jim, but also free to make a selection. I think what you said there is like key. Like, don't make an RFP that doesn't allow you to select the vendor you like because of some scoring criteria that says they're not the best, right? Or whatever it may be. Yeah, exactly. So one last note that I had was, the other thing is, don't ask for a response that's going to get you a 100-page response and you're going to get 15 responses. And now your selection team has to review 1,500 pages of documents. So in other words... Don't ask for more than you care to review. Scope it. <laughs> don't ask questions you don't care about. Ask the questions you do care about. Ask for more information if you need it. You know, I think if, if a company is taking time to respond to this, t- chances are that, of course, they want your business, right? And they want, they need information to try and put together the best response possible. So, you know, if you're able to take the time to answer questions, you know, a lot of companies might have like, okay, we're going to open up our bridge and we'll do a question and answer sensor, you know, session now. And people can answer questions, right? Or ask questions or maybe. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to say be easy with it, <laughs> but only ask the stuff you care about and try to try to look for reasons to say, why are we asking this question? Is this mandatory? Or is this a nice to have, or is this just plain not a, not relevant at all? And let's cut it. Right, right. Yep. And then try to design your questions that they're all not all yes or no questions, where you have very objective criteria on you know whoever we get the most yeses from, they're going to win the business. Whoever gives us the lowest price, they're going to get the business. Give people ask open ended questions like we do on this podcast. You're, t- you're going to probably learn a lot more and you'll see if people actually give thought to your questions or if they just, when you see your RFP response database and pull a bunch of stuff out and pasted it in, it, that's what you get back. I mean, you did not get the 18 from that, from that, uh, respondent and look for the one where people put time into responding. They need, yeah. they need or really care about getting that business and you'll get a better product from now on that. And just like every other industry, AI is impacting the RFP business, just like anyone else, you True. know, it's making it easier to write responses and to have question banks of, you know, answers that you've previously used and things like that. So I, the idea of an open-ended question is very, is very good to make sure that you're not just getting a canned response. Some things will be canned. To, you know, when was your company formed? How long have you been in business? Like that story doesn't change. Think about the questions that really that you want to get more of a, you know, less canned responses from <laughs> and ask them in a way that it is open-ended that they can't use. Okay, well, we use this answer for this one. Let's copy paste it from there and put it here. Good enough. All right. Good luck. <laughs> agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Great question out of Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Alfred. And we spent 20 minutes talking about RFPs. <laughs> <laughs> Which is generally 20 minutes more than I ever want to talk about RFPs. <laughs> so, so, Jeff, I do have a question for you about an upcoming trip of yours. Before we do that, I wanted to mention an update on my dad. Or actually, it's a, it's a really weird thing that happened yesterday. So I okay. wake up to a text message from Katie that my dad is on the way to the hospital. And I left you a voicemail. So I looked, checked my voicemail. The female's voice saying, you know, this is Katie, your dad's on the way to the hospital. I wasn't able, you know, to get you or whatever. I'm freaking out. So I call my dad and he's fine. And then I, I text this person back. I'm like, 
I just talked to my dad and he's like, oh, sorry, I texted the wrong person. So I didn't know if it was like some kind of scam, but yeah. it was kind of nice because I talked to my dad for like a half hour. <laughs> they gave me an update and mm-hmm. uh, we talked a lot about cybersecurity <laughs> and how he doesn't answer the phone unless he knows the number and stuff like that. So he's coming along, by the way. I figured I'd give you that update. I don't think he's usually a flip phone anymore. Um, and, uh, and I guess thank you to Katie for getting me to call <laughs> my dad, but also no thanks for the, uh, your heart yeah. attack. <laughs> a spoiler alert. It was actually your dad pretending to be Katie on a different account. He's gone beyond. He's way more advanced than he's letting on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's using AI. He's some, some kind of bot to make sure that I call him on a <laughs> yes. periodic basis. Um, that's nefar- that so, could be nefarious, but uh, that's interesting. Well, I'm glad to hear your dad's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what are you? What are you up to? You're going on a, a surprise 50th birthday um, party, and I'm wondering, what do you think of surprise parties? You know, I don't. I don't think I've ever been a part of one before. So this is kind of my first time. Uh, yeah, it is a surprise birthday party. Uh, a bunch of us are flying into Dallas from kind of parts unknown. Uh, this is somebody that I've known for 30, almost 30 years, 25 years, met at Chili's in Bolingbrook way a long time ago. And we're a crew that has been very close kind of since then. And so it'd be good to, you know, see folks uh, that kind of came out of that. So, you know, my friend Jeff, Jason, Chad, we're all getting together. My wife is coming with me. So we actually found someone to come and watch our dogs. My brother is actually going to fly in, watch the dogs for us for the weekend, enjoy Asheville. And the Tesla, while well, my wife and I are in Dallas with our friends kind of hanging out for this surprise birthday party. Um, it is being coordinated by uh, his wife, which is, I find it very cool. And so it's basically like we're meeting at a hotel to get on a party bus and then drive to their house and sort of surprise him at their house. And then we're doing some sort of like a, a escape room thing, I think, afterwards. So by the time this show goes live, that event will have occurred. So um very much looking forward to it it's been a long time since uh, we've kind of gotten the crew back together um so i don't know what to expect other than i'm sure he's going to be shocked if the if surprise holds true because the number of people coming in is like 20 or 25 his yeah. parents and we're flying in from all over the place florida north carolina south carolina illinois and they're in dallas now and so you know people taking the time to come out and, and do this i think is very cool that's really awesome so did your wife work it was she a chili head too no, she did not. We met at a different restaurant because that's how I roll, uh, moving around restaurants <laughs> when I was younger. Um, no, she was not with Chili's, uh, but the Chili's crew was sort of like my college years. <laughs> and okay. so, you know, we lived together in a house. Um, you know, my friends Jeff and Jason and Chad, we were basically inseparable for many years. And of course, we've got older and, you know, families and stuff like that. So it's been a little bit tougher to stay in touch, but, uh, um, very much kind of the crew getting back together. And every time, you know, it might be, you know, it could be five years, two years, a year, 30 seconds since I last talked to one of them. And it's like, you know, it's what, it's like that friendship group that's like, you just pick up right where you left off. Nothing has changed. Everyone still has the same personalities and kind of getting together. It's like no time has passed when we get into a room together. That sounds so cool, man. I had a great, great trip. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's been a while since I had a vacation. Uh, or like a real vacation. So um, it'll be, you know, a day or so, but uh, we'll it'll take a while to go on a real vacation and you go to Dallas. <laughs> well, Nothing last year I went to Dallas, London. But it's not the vacation capital of the world. Well, this is a busy month. Uh, so I have that. And then let's see the weekend. So I get back from that on like a Tuesday, a couple of days of working. And then I fly to South Bend, I think it is, uh, to go to Michigan for my brother's bachelor party kind of weekend. So that's another weekend after that. We'll be like figuring that out. And then I think I go to New York city the week after that. And then the actual wedding for my brother is in Chicago at the end of the month. It's like every weekend this month, I'm basically like busy. (laughs) Yes. Going somewhere. Get ready. You'll be watching all the episodes of of identity center. It's going to be just me and our guests. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. I wouldn't put you through just me. It's going to be me and the guest, but we're, we're going to be missing out on Jeff for a few episodes this month. Yeah, we try. That's why I said it. like it's, it's been a lot of hassle trying to co- coordinate schedules and stuff like that for this month. 
so yeah, there will probably be a couple episodes here where I'm not able to make it, but I will be editing them. So um, I can make Jim say whatever I want to say to the power of post production. <laughs> As you have done before. <laughs> All right. Why don't we go ahead and wrap it up there? Um, anything else? YouTube. Go YouTube. IDACpodcast.tv will take you straight to our YouTube channel. Hit that like and, and subscribe button. We're ha- trying to grow the channel and uh, yeah, put a lot of effort into that. Uh, see on the web, IDACpodcast.com, Twitter, X, whatever it's called, at IDAC Podcast. And yeah, uh, LinkedIn. Feel free to reach out to us, connect, send us ideas, send us feedback on our website. You know, if something's broken, let Best me know. Future, so can fix future it. episodes. What's that? Be like, be like Alfred. Send yeah. us questions for future episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Send us, you know, whatever it may be, uh, you know, whether it's I am or not, we'll, we'll try to find a time to answer it. <laughs> All right. Let's go leave it there. Thanks everybody for watching and or listening. And we'll talk with y'all in the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.